Hey everybody, it's Jim here, and in today's episode of the Audio Mall Podcast, posting a conversation I had with Rob last week. This was our second go at it. The first one, I forgot to hit record, so it was really just a fun hour and a half, two hours of us talking, but today, talk about cigarettes, we talk about alcohol, we talk about all of that kind of stuff when it comes to rock and roll, cheaper gear being a lot of fun when it isn't really being compared to the high-end stuff, just enjoying stuff for what it is, and just life, man. It's a fun conversation. He also has a YouTube channel. If you've not subscribed to it, I highly recommend checking it out. It is very amusing. He's a very, very fun-loving guy. So I hope you enjoy this. I know we were talking the other week. We didn't didn't record it, but I was talking about being given musical instruments and stuff like that, and also the fact that I like giving stuff away. It's sort of like one of my mates at work, this young lad, Toby, who's about 19, really, really awesome kid, really enthusiastic about all sorts of stuff. He went to see Ramstein a couple of weeks ago, right? Oh, that's awesome. And he he loved it. He, he's been raving about it, and he's he's – it's got him into playing guitar again because he's realized all of their songs are just power chords. And if you've learned one, you've learned them all. It's, it, and so he then brought his old guitar into work and just said, can you have a look at it? Just to, he wanted to know if, if the strings needed changing really. If, and it was a little Ibanez GX 30. So it's sort of a little bolt on neck, very budget SG sort of double cut sort of style stuff, I guess two humbuckers. Um, and it looked all right. It looked all right. It had elixirs on there. So, um, so anyway, I said, yeah, don't bother changing the strings. I came home and I thought, I watched a video on the guitar and I found a Dawson's video and the guy plugged it in and it sounded all right and he put it through distortion and it sounded not great. So I remembered I had those PRS SE Tremonti pickups lying around that I've had for years. Uh, yeah. And so I watched a video on someone demoing one of those and it sounded freaking amazing. So I went, I literally walked back into work like immediately, it was my day off and took the pickups into Toby. And he fitted them over the weekend, and he's just said it's like freaking amazing. And he's also using the Sans amp thing. You know the you know the Sans amp thing. Mm-hmm. One the, one of the guitarists out of Ramstein, there is actually his custom model, and you can buy it. And he that's what he uses. That's his rig. This little that's Sans why. amp thing about this big. So you've got yeah. a clean and dirty amp channel. You've got a XLR DI out. You've got a quarter inch out with headphone so cabinet modelling. And then all you've got is a clean, dirty channel, uh, delay, compression, and then boost, I think. But you've got all these Ramstein sound. And he's using that. And I actually, I think they're really good value. They're about 300 quid. And I've been looking into them. I, I wonder if something like that would do really well for your setup, if they did a cleaner version. Yeah. The Sansamp stuff, if you've looked at them or not. I've looked at some of the Sansamp stuff, but most of it, like you said, it's game. Yeah. It's game, 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 game. Yeah. And I, I have fun with it. I've been playing a lot more silly stuff since I got the the light Gibson, the the one that weighs nothing, weighs less than my Telecaster does. Oh. I've been playing a lot of heavy game that I don't normally I don't normally play that kind of stuff, but I've been having a lot of fun with it. But you're right. As a whole, I kind of stick to the to the clean tones. It, yeah. I, I, I that that's the thing that sucks that I've found with a lot of modeling stuff and a lot of like small kind of things like that. They don't necessarily give me what I really like in that no. sense. No, no, I think because um, it was interesting. You t- we were talking on your um, live stream the other day. The, the guy asked a question about the Roland Microcube, mm-hmm. and I sort of expected your answer on that because I know you're coming from somewhere <laughs> completely different. But it's, it's, I, I yeah. do understand it. But I actually think, first of all, Roland don't know how to make crap really. Or boss, they don't really know how to make. They make stuff that works, that does a job. It lasts forever, most of it. I don't know about the newer stuff and whatever, but um, I think with a microcube, hey, they're so. T- that, but it's the clues in the name. They're tiny. They're less sort of size, and they don't weigh anything. So they're. My brother's got two of them at home in a cab in a cabinet underneath his record player, and he's li- literally got eight, two of those. Each one linked to an old like multi-effects zoom pedal that he paid about 20 quid for his first ever multi He wanted to get a multi-effects pedal, didn't know anything about them. And I just said, look, for 20 odd quid, buy one. It will sound a bit like, but it will be fun and you'll have. So he's got two and he's programmed every patch, like hundred patches identical on both of them. And so when he wants to play, or if I go over there, we literally just drag an amp and drag a pedal out each and we plug our guitars in and we have a whale of a time on it, you know? And I've yeah. never, never felt that they sounded awful. The only time yeah. I've thought about the sound is when they've actually surprised me and gone, bloody hell, I'm really blown away that this is 
not comparing it to a tube amp. It's like saying, it's like me saying, I want something to get down the shops on. I'm thinking of a little electric scooter. And then someone going, yeah, but a Range Rover would be much better. Well, yeah, right, you know, yes, but I'm just pootling down a shop on it. I'm not, and it's sort of, so I think you can have a lot of fun with those things. Um, and they are what they are, you know, 100, 100 quid, but they weigh nothing. I've seen people busking with them in town. You hear people busking with them. Yeah. Uh, they're certainly powerful enough to fill a little room and stuff. So, but I, th- I thought that was no. I thought that was really interesting. Um, I loved how my little twenty watt Roland amp sounds with a little eight inch speaker in it, until my mate bought a fourteen inch cab and a one and a half watt valve amp round it. It was just all oh, right, okay, yeah, fair enough. I'll get it. But while you're playing it, you don't care. Yeah. And I think this is a thing with guitars as well. We think we, I've got to get this guitar. I've got to get that. Oh, this guitar's better than this. This Gibson is better than this Ibanez. Mm-hmm. If you're playing the Ibanez for 10 minutes, you couldn't care less because you don't actually know what the Gibson sounds like at that point. It's only when you yes. do a direct comparison with it. Yes. Yeah. So it's all all good fun. So um, I was hoping to go and jam with my brother on the microcubes this weekend, but it just keeps getting put off. Now there's a train strike. So we can't do it. And then my brother realised his driving licence has expired. <laughs> I didn't realise he was 90 years old. He looks all right for his life. I don't know why. So he's, he's, we've been trying since May to get together. And um, I've, I've bought him that pedal, the Mellotron, the Mel 9. Mm. I bought him that for his birthday. So I, I, I won't tell him. I won't get him to watch this, so he won't know. But uh, I want to give him that Mel 9 pedal before I like it too much and don't give it away. <laughs> That can be a problem. I've done stuff like that in the past. I, I do. I do. I do have to say this. We, you're talking about the microcube and all that stuff. I've had a battery powered. I think it's a five inch speaker Fender Mustang Micro. Yeah. That I've. I, I, it's got to be ten years old. I bring that to the beach. And yeah. when, I, when I lived in California, I would sit on the beach with it. I had a Mexican Telecaster. I would just sit on the sand. And not at any point when I was sitting there playing along was I thinking to myself, I really wish I had my big old music band tube amp here. This just isn't cutting it for me. No, exactly. It's all about what you, the situation you're in and what you're trying to get out of it. So I definitely, I I, I could see where there's definitely appeal for things like that. And I I like them too. I'm not always just like, Oh, this has to be this way and that way. Like I I use a lot of cheap stuff for fun. When When I was recording this week, I ended up using things that were much cheaper than some of the more expensive alternatives I had because I was just like, oh, this just sounds right. What, what, right. what am I going to screw around about? It, it sounds good. Don't overthink it. Just do it. Yeah, brilliant. Definitely. Definitely. I'm a, I'm a big, yeah, big fan of that. You can do a lot. Just, well, I was, I was going to do the video on this um, Santana guitar. I haven't, I haven't got around to it yet. And yeah. I, I think I mentioned that people had said the pickups were meh. And actually the fact is they are a bit, but... Mm. That doesn't mean that you can't make it sound freaking good. No. Um, I've got that pistol slapper booster here, and it just puts teeth on any guitar. So I'm going to – yeah, so I do agree with something on a gear forum that the pickups are a bit – but it doesn't really matter because a little bit of imagination, an EQ pedal or something like that in front of it, you can – so I've been yeah. messing with that with virtual rigs and things like that this week, just uh, yeah, getting some interesting sounds. So – Looking forward to that. So that's settled all right. That's settled okay, that guitar. Um, that's good. I, I, I'm, I'm really happy to hear about that Ibanez, too. I think that's really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. The, he, he was so happy. I mean, I, I spoke to I haven't seen the lad until today. And I just said, oh, did you get a chance? He said, oh, my God, I was going to say, like, yeah. <laughs> Him and his dad fitted the pickup. I think they must have listened to it before. And then just said, oh, what's it sound like? And he said, oh, for fucking hell, fells. And it's like, this is good. This is really good. <laughs> but it was, it was, yeah, I'm so, I'm so, so happy. It's got a really good home. And he's, um, and that's just brought so much life into that guitar. You know, he said he was going to buy, maybe buy some pickups. And I said, well, don't go spending a load of money on pickups. Mm-hmm. I think I paid maybe 20 or 30 or 40 quid for those eight or nine years ago, second hand. They weren't expensive. And uh, I, I never got onto the project I was going to do. And they'd just been sitting there doing nothing. Ironically, they probably would have been really good in that Santana guitar. <laughs> yeah. Because the pickups are a bit... <laughs> well, 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 the thing with pickups, too, if they're if they're remotely decent clean, you can make it work with just the EQ on your amp or an EQ pedal. You you can make up for all that stuff. Like, yeah. you, you don't have to do that. And 
My, the only reason I replace pickups on some guitars, the majority of the guitars I have now, they're the factory equipment. But the reason I do it is because I need, I, I like it clean. Everything I do is based on clean. If it doesn't sound good clean, I'm not interested in it. And it's funny because some people, it, it's just like with cars, right? Some people think that uh, like a $40,000 Toyota Supra is like, uh, uh, how can you justify holding such an expensive guitar? And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have a GT3 Porsche guy, yeah. and then the Ferrari guy and a Lamborghini guy. They laugh at the guy with the Supra. In the terms of like guitar pickups, people are like, you're spending $200 on a set of Lindy Frowns? Are you crazy? And then I look on Reverb, and I see there's companies like Throwback, and you know people that sell the vintage pickups from these old Les Pauls and Telecasters, oh, yeah. one thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, and I'm like, I'm like who's buying that? And so yeah. it's like it's all about what's important to you and like what you find the value in. For me, the sweet spot is like new two hundred dollars. I, I I don't think I could do more than that at this yeah. point. And what sucks about Paul Reed Smith, if you want to keep everything like in line with Paul Reed Smith and the family of products. The pickups that they do sell are like four hundred bucks a pop, and I'm like, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. Nah, nah, that's uh, no, that's. I think as long as there's a particular feel to pickups or any guitar, I think that's there's a yeah. there's a particular sort of response I like from a guitar. It's this it's response to dynamics for me is really what I go for. I yeah. don't just like a guitar that gets louder. I like a guitar yeah. that changes and blooms, and, and and that's one of the things I like about the PRS. That's one of the things I used, I loved about my old Ovations when I was playing them and this Yamaha and stuff. That's what I look for is something that comes alive when you lay into it. Um, and actually, it's a weird thing. Um, I remember playing, a friend of mine bought a Taylor, Taylor 12-string, the Leo Cocky Taylor 12-string. It's a phenomenal piece of kit, you know. My mate plays fingerstyle, and, and, and I, I was allowed a very quick go on it only about a couple of minutes because my fingers just let out alien acid and just ruined strings and stuff. So he was like, <laughs> so he came out with all these excuses. Oh no, I've tuned it up. I'm in the middle of recording. I was no, no, no. I just like, but it, it, it sounded amazing, but it didn't sound or respond anything like what I wanted it to. Um, it, it was like a Bose music system where it fills the room, but there's something sort of missing. artificial about it, sort of a lack of air and space and that. And it didn't, I've got this old Yamaha 12 string over there and it growls and it barks and it farts and it bites and it goes at you. And it just, it, the freaking thing's alive. It's scary. It's a beast, you know, but the yeah. tailor, the tailor was incredible. You could hear the, every single note on it and the articulation was amazing, but it sounded like a Bose to me. And given the choice of having a Bose system, even though they sound amazing or an old hi-fi, I know what I'd rather listen to, to my ears, you know? So it, interesting stuff, I think. That's funny you say that too, because out of all the guitars I have, I, the one that I'm going to talk about is a semi-hollow. It's the Japanese one. That's like it's yeah. probably the cheapest guitar out of all the ones that I, I've kept, and I have no interest in selling it. And the, one of the reasons I love that guitar so much has nothing to do with price, has nothing to do with anything that's equipped electronically. That guitar, as soon as I took it out of the hard case, it rang like a bell in a way that I'm like, I'm like, this is a good guitar. I'm like, yeah. I, I don't know anything about this, but this, I can tell you right away when a guitar rings like that, I'm like, oh yeah. Yeah. Because there's a response to it. And I played, and I had that $2,500 Fender Jaguar that was brand new that came in, the blue one. It sounded dead. Mm. Like, it, it, it sounded and it felt dead. It looked the part when you plugged it in. It, it passed. Like, you know what I mean? It, was, it wasn't a bad sounding guitar, yeah. but it didn't have any life to it. And I'm like, well, why on earth would I keep a guitar like this that feels dead? And you, because... You know, it's just not something I'm ever going to bond with. And it's a good lesson. And it doesn't matter if a guitar is made in America or made in Japan or wherever the hell it's made. It could be any price point. Sometimes you just get really lucky. And if you can get lucky at a lower price, like with that 77, dude, I love that guitar. It's yeah. just, it's just, it just works. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that might be why I didn't bond with the Revstar actually thinking. I know when I, I yeah. I've only demoed the Revstar once, I tried yeah. it very briefly in a shop and I was in a very, very screwed up headspace. I was, I was in a really bad way. So, and I was killing time uh, before finding out if I was going to lose my eyesight in one eye. That was, that was my headspace at the time. So yeah. it was a bit stressful, but so I wasn't in the best, but it sounded great, but it didn't do anything when I hit it harder. It didn't come alive 
I'm going to go and try him again at some point because like, that wasn't a fair choice. But that was the thing really that struck me about it. It sounded incredible, but that's what it sounded like. And I'll I'm, be honest with you, Rob. I tried one after we spoke. Yeah. I had the same exact takeaway. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. I thought that it sounded like I, I I thought it played so well, like it felt like a a, a, a very highly crafted yeah. guitar, like yeah. it should, as advertised. I thought that. It, it, it had a decent sound to it, but yeah. it didn't have that, like, it just felt generic. It felt like a guitar that somebody sat at a spec sheet and said, it has to have this, it has to have that, it's got to come in at this price. It was built by, like, accountants and marketing people. And I don't know. And it was a good guitar. I'm not saying it's bad, no. but I had the exact same take. I was just like, this just kind of feels like good guitar. And sometimes with, like, the SE and the S2 PRSs, even I've played core PRSs where I've had the same exact feeling. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, this is built great. Yeah, I'm not going to have any problems with it, but like, I, I don't feel anything with it, you know? No, it's weird. It's weird. I mean, my Starcaster, I bonded with that 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 thing. And I know yeah. it's cheap and it's trashy and it's got issues and Who the cares? wiring is dreadful. I fucking love playing that thing, man. It just puts <laughs> such a huge, huge smile on my face. It begs for fuzz. I never use fuzz. I don't think I've ever used fuzz on any, pretty much anything ever since. But that guitar, it just makes me play trashy and I put such a smile on my face. And I think if I could change the wiring in it, I'm, I'm not going to do it because it's a semi-hollow body. I might, if I can find someone else who wants to get their arm stuck in that. Oh, but that, that you know, smiles per pound or whatever, smiles per dollar, that thing just, just beats everything here, I think. That just makes me laugh so much, that guitar. And I don't care about it because it was a cheap guitar. And it's yeah. a classic. And I deliberately bought the most boring looking one, the plainest one I could find. I didn't want the f any fancy finish. It's just, <laughs> and it and it's brilliant. I'm so well because when I bought the Ibanez, like the the AG95 and the AS93, I would have rather have had something plainer. But I've yeah. ended up with like quilted ash and flame maple, which look amazing. But it just want to trash the hell out of it. Really, yeah. it doesn't suit me. But you know. That, that that's the problem I have with Paul Smith guitars. That's the problem I have with them. I'm like, it's so beautiful. Like I I I I I, I want to get like a, a display for the thing, and then I just like just so I can just like keep it safe because I got a dog. He scratched the hell out of my Les Paul the other night. Let me tell you something. I left it in its case, but I had the case open. The idiot comes in. He's just like, ooh ooh, this looks like something my my papa wouldn't want me to touch. Let me fuck it up. <laughs> so right so right on the face of it, you could see where his paw. <laughs> right went down you know i'm keeping the thing but i'm just i'm like you little shit oh, but, but but i think about it where i wasn't that that mad because i'm like yeah, it already has scratches on it. it's a gibson whatever i don't know who cares if he had done that to the purple prs he'd be, he'd be in the garage still yeah he'd still be in the garage i don't think he'd be out but it, it, it's just it's weird how that works like the psychology of it, it when is. it comes to these guitars but i it's part of the reason i kind of like the, 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 uh, like beating up my own guitars and I can understand why some people like lightly relic stuff. I know me and you, we'll, we'll get back into this because yeah, it's yeah. so good. It's worth rehashing again, but yeah. I, I start to understand it now, especially once you have little ones running around and all that stuff and things are going to get damaged. It's inevitable. Yeah. So I, I don't know. And I, I just, I, I prefer not having to be with, with, with surgeon's gloves, so to yeah. speak with some of these instruments. Well, it's, my brother, my brother bought the PRS um, SE. It's the King Crimson model, the Jacko Jack Six signature one. Yeah, so it's yeah, got, yeah, yeah. and it's freaking great. And that mate, hearing that through his micro cube one day, this actually, I was out in the garden over it is having a cigarette. He was inside, and I, there was this electronic music coming, and um, I thought, well, that's Tangerine Dream. He's listening to some Tangerine Dream on his hi-fi because I could hear this guitar as well. And I went in there and I noticed it was my brother playing his guitar through his microcube while his bloody expensive hi-fi in the next room was playing some German electronic Klaus Schultz. And it sounded freaking great from the garden. And that was my right. I've got to get one of them PRS guitars, right? Well, I'll just get an SE. I didn't have a lot of money. Um, yeah. And then Andertons did a epic deal. They had three limited edition colours and obviously end of the line. One was yeah. like a perloid white, looked beautiful. One was metallic blue. The one I got, because I didn't want these problems, I wanted a PRS, I, you know, even an SE that I didn't have to care about. Yeah. So, <laughs> I already know what it looks like. Matte yeah. black. Satin matte black. And it's freaking great. 
I don't even know if it's scratched because it's so dark you can't tell anyway. Who but cares? It's made, it's made a huge difference. I treat this like it's a guitar, not like it's anything. I mean, it's, I say it's only a, you know, it's a standard SE, but it's it's yeah. it's mine, you know. Um, and so I don't treat I don't think it badly. Should, but don't knock it down. Yeah, no, don't knock it down like that. I Just saying, like, I oh, it's only great. an SE. If well, the guitar what, is good and you like yeah. it, who cares? I love it. I think this is freaking great. Providing I don't play it next to a core and listen to that and go, oh, right, okay, I can hear the difference. If I don't play it next to one, then I think these are great. Great things. But well, yeah, isn't that the Black... problem with YouTube? Yeah. Wouldn't you say that, Rob? Because you make videos too. And yeah. you, do some, you do some screwing around with sounds and shit like that. Yeah. I, I find myself, I know, because I don't necessarily want to always be like, here's new product, you buy new product. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't like that part of it. So I, I've started to do more of the, you're not going to see which guitar is which. Just tell me which one you like better. You know what I mean? Or tell me what you think it is. I find yeah. fun in that. But at the same time, it's like, it's such a unique situation because I'm recording it in my house through my rig, through all this. Everything is is as a variable, and some people will will take something like that very verbatim. And yeah. make a decision and be like, well, I can't do that because of this or this. It's just, uh, it's, it's kind of frustrating, man, you know? I think um, could, channels you watch quite a lot, you get used to their sound and what their stuff, yeah. what kit sounds like. So that's generally what I try and do is, I'll, if, I'm, if I'm thinking of buying something, I'll obviously do the thing of going on YouTube and trying to look. But if I can see people that I recognize, that I know either have good... It, You'll be how you you hear whether a guitar is, is is awful or not. It doesn't really matter what they're putting it through. If it's squealy and it's just got no life, you'll hear that. Mm -hmm. You you can cover up a certain, but you can also tell by that by how smoothly they're playing and you know how comfortable their fingers look on the guitar. Because sometimes you can tell they're not into it and they're just going through the motions. And so you've got to look out for all that body language stuff as well. And also mm -hmm. what they don't say is a lot of it. Obviously these people are getting paid, but I think. Um, <laughs> I think just watch a couple of if, if someone's got something, watch a couple of their videos or bits and pieces just to see what their rig generally sounds like and adjust your ears accordingly. And that that seems to no, no two guitar players are going to make the guitar sound the same either. So yeah, yeah it's that's crazy, very true. So, you know. Even even, even, a, even a change of, of even just a change of pick. I mean, you could do 20 different oh, guitar yeah. reviews, say doing a blind review, and you could just change the pick, and you could people would be convinced you had a completely different guitar. It's insane, really. So, um, I've I've got one thumb pick that is very very nylony, and it just it makes everything sound like the front pickup on a Les Paul. Doesn't matter what you're playing, even a mandolin. You know, it's like. Yeah. And then the other thumb pick, which is just ice pick, just ice pick over everything. So. And yeah. But, but I think I want to have fun with that too. Part of part of what I've I've been planning to do for a while is do one of those blind things and then just completely screw with people. Like, just not have it be at all what they think it is. Whether it's I'm doing two guitars that are not the two guitars I said. Yeah. Or just doing one guitar with yeah. a different gauge of string or through a different pedal or something like yeah. that. Or even through a different – just to do it, be like, look, like, look, you guys. Use a different pick. We just got it. Use, I mean, just uh, use like, a different freaking pick. I just see just have fun with it. And, how, and, and can you really trust some of these people? You can't. No. And, and what, part of the reason I, I'm very happy – that I don't get paid by companies to do this is because <laughs> first I'm very blunt. And I think that's part of the the, the reason why some people like me and some people don't like me. I, I wear everything on my sleeve pretty, pretty yeah. hard. And it, you'll know if I don't like something and yeah. I would, I would, I, I, I would hate to be in a position where you have to just like dance around something you really don't like about a guitar or an amp or anything like that. That And it's, it's, it's awkward. Cause I've seen people do it. Like you see it in their face. And like you said, the body language. You watch yeah. them during the demo and they're just like, mm, you know, I'm doing it. Or they don't even show themselves when they typically would show their face playing along. Yeah. You know, they're just, they're, 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 yeah. they're, they're, they're cashing in. Good for them. But when they're trying to say all the positives and it's just like, yeah, I'm lukewarm. Here's my yeah. link to buy it. Yeah, it's, well, but for someone else, that might be what they want, providing it's usable yeah. and workable. It might have exactly the sound they want. So again, you've got to bring this personal thing into it. I know. Just because I don't like the sound of something, it doesn't mean it's no good. It just means that it doesn't work for me. Say so, you know, EMG pickups probably wouldn't be ideal for me, considering, you know, but no. if I was playing, but then, you know, this, 
PRS parlor guitar is probably not good if you're into death metal. So there you go. <laughs> so it swings around about. You know. Well, we should put the EMG pickup in that PRS parlor guitar and we'll start a folk death metal band. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> What that would get me drinking it? again. <laughs> <laughs> I've already started. It's great. So, yeah. But that's that's a crazy uh, one. That's become my most used guitar by far, this thing. I think it's because of the size. Yeah. Regardless of tone, regardless of anything else, it's because it's comfortable and it sits nice when I'm sitting on slouching on my sofa. Um, so it's become that's that's what's determined by most num my number one guitar. Because I can play it sitting on the sofa comfortably. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And with the with the other Gibson, the blue one that's behind me, it's scaled down from a yeah. normal Les Paul. And even though it's not as good, and it's it is nowhere near as expensive new as the the Les Paul standard I have, I I, I play that guitar all the time. It's so much lighter. It's a little bit smaller. I I sit back in the chair. I don't care. I'm sitting on the couch. I don't care. Dog yeah. scratches it. I care, but I'm not crying about it. Yeah. It's just, it's it's funny how that works out. It's not always just like the dearest thing becomes the thing that you gravitate towards the most. It could just no. be a matter of comfort. Yeah, actually, that Starcaster, thinking about it, that sits really nice because it's offset. Even yeah. though it's like a semi-hollow thing, it's not that wide, but it's offset. So that sits great. As long as you don't have to tune, you know, the, the <laughs> whatever it is, the furthest string because the headstock's about a foot and a half long. Oh, it's so terrible. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's hilarious. I just love showing people a picture of the, the guitar and scrolling up and scrolling up and when they get to the headstock and it just keeps scrolling and keeps scrolling. Yeah. It's, like, it's just excessive for no reason. I love it. It's, it's daft. But yeah, I think comfort's a lot to do with it. So that's oh, that's old that's old age. I think so. Well, I, yeah, you're a little bit older than I am, but I'm not young anymore. I, I'm pushing right on the door of 40. So these oh. little things that, that never used to, to bother me like no. that. They're they're deal breakers now, and no, I'm like, think, all right, well, I'm good. I don't care. I don't I don't need it. If it's not perfect as far as comfort, well, whatever, I'll get rid of it. Who cares? Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing I noticed turning forty, I'm trying to remember, was that how much more drink affected me at that point. It won't won't bother you at the moment because you don't drink anymore. But yeah, uh, and the last this last year or so, my ability to drink beer has been ridiculous. I mean, I'm I'm near much 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 nearer to 60 and 40 <laughs> about three years off 60 i think at the minute so i think that's something yeah. that, that sort of thing so but um yeah i just need more sleep it just takes more time to recover from everything and if you're accident prone and you bash yourself on things quite often um then that, yeah that's just, just like, as soon as one I, is, is, is sewn back on something else falls off so that's that's nice <laughs> I was starting to feel that way when I was stopping well, right before I quit drinking in like the last six months. Like I was, I'd, I'd have to drink in the morning again because I was just like, Oh my God, like I feel so shit. And the yeah. only way to get rid of it is that. And then that, that that's dangerous. Yeah. That's when things start to get out of control. When you have, when you're older, your body does need to sleep. So if you don't sleep and the only way to fight off how terrible you feel from drinking before is to keep drinking. When I was in my 20s, I, I, I was able to work 60 hours a week, binge drink, go out, play afterwards. I was fine. Oh, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't think anything of any of it. I was just like, this is like, who complains about this? Mick Jagger's still doing it. And at the time, he was like 50. I don't know. What is he, like 90 yeah. now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it, but it's it, it just it, that guy i don't know how people could do it at that age how, how you could still be into drugs and alcohol and be functioning after I 70 I, I, I think they're clean aren't they i think the well but bill i mean mick jagger i think is pretty clean i think i think um didn't keith richard really? give up smoking or did smoking really? give up keith richard i think i don't know about any of this but i'm not going to say for certain if they do or don't but uh. i know there are a lot of bands and a lot of people that still kind of kind of do that and i mean that's <laughs> that's tough as you get older, especially, you know, we have it easy, Rob. We're not on airplanes. We're not on tour no. buses doing this every day. Can you imagine that? And all the alcohol and you're not sleeping enough on top no. of it. I'll forget it. No, forget it. I, I, just drop me off. I'll take, I'll be at the hotel for a week. <laughs> I had a, um, uh, what we call it. Years ago, I had an opportunity to do an audition for a couple of people. I'm, I'm, the, story, the point is, I never got the audition. I, I, the, the audition fell to pieces. I was living miles away. Something came up. It just never happened, whatever. But, and I'm glad I didn't, 
because I wouldn't have even made the 27 club. I would, would not have made the 27 the club if that had happened. Um, tra- there used to be a guy, my, my old mate Danny, he had a lodger, this guy, Dave, that played the drums. And back then, in my late teens, early 20s, I had a reputation. I mean, literally, pretty much a country-long reputation at various universities for being this absolute freaking animal, like, drink monster thing. And, um, and it's difficult to... Once you've got a reputation like that, you live up to it. It's expected of you. But basically, I'd turn up somewhere, people would ply me with alcohol, throw a guitar at me, and it was like, wind him up. Wind up Captain Chaos. That was why it's Captain Chaos and let him go. Anyway, I used to sing filthy songs. Anyway, so so I get this audition. And um, this this drummer, Dave, says, oh, yeah, we'd like, like, but at least, you know, Rob's writing songs and he's doing stuff. So they wanted me to be the singer and writer for this band, right? This was mid-1980s, 86, 87. Mm. And uh, it was this guy, Dave, who was a drummer, and a guy called Graham, who was a guitar player, and they came from Colchester in Essex. And it never happened, but I'd only found out, like, about two or three years ago, that was Graham Coxon and Dave Roundtree from Blur. (laughs) (laughs) My mate Danny only told me that, like, a couple of years ago, (laughs) really. Do you remember that old disc? Because he bumped into Dave again and was chatting and that, but, yeah. So wouldn't it have been dreadful if I'd have made that when I was a 20-year-old alcoholic? I yeah, mean, a real... Perfect. It, I wouldn't have made 27. I would have been lucky to have made 22, you know, if if, if I'd have found yeah. fame and fortune with anything at all. So I'm very pleased I, that never came off. I was similar in the same way with uh, some other activities outside of the drinking and on top of the drinking. Hmm. So I, I know, and yeah. I, it's part of the reason I was glad I also never fell into that kind of opportunity because it would have ended so badly yeah. so badly everything i've done has been like pretty modest so it's, it's yeah. nothing nothing to um to get too big into my head or anything like that no. which is which is good because you can't especially when you're when you're an addict man when you're when you're doing that kind of oh. stuff as, as you're born there i don't give a shit by the way it, it doesn't really bother me i know yeah. some people that are like like should i not i'm like dude dude you do whatever the hell you want i'm an adult you're an adult who cares yeah but what, what i did want to talk about to you we, we started to talk about this last time and when it comes to the drinking, two things. The yeah. first is using it for the wrong reason. And that's what I mean is for anxiety specifically. Yeah. Now, you have extensive experience with this. I yeah. have extensive experience with yeah. this. What what advice would you give to somebody who who is who's doing it to, to specifically? They're not even drinking for fun. You're not yeah. drinking for fun. You're drinking yeah. just to, 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 to kill it off. What do you think? Um, if you have the control to have a tiny amount, I mean, it's like I find that half a glass of red wine or something like that is really nice to take the edge off. It just sharpens off the corners. The trick is being able to stop after half a glass or, you know, not doing a bottle, then doing another bottle and not expecting that all the time. So you've got to be able to limit yourself. Um, If ever I get to a position now, I mean, I've been, I've, I still drink. I did give up drink for like months and months, seven months, eight months at a time, several times. And I've, and I've been off absolutely everything. Now I smoke tobacco, I like a bit of weed and a bit of red wine. And that's me done. And I'm very, very, very happy. So that's, that's cool. Um, yeah. And maybe the odd magic mushroom here or there if it come about. But that's a <laughs> story, which actually has been fantastic for my depression recently. Absolutely like ludicrous, but that's a different thing. But um it just takes I, – I was put on all sorts of pills as a kid. I was oh, I was God. guinea pigged on all sorts of pills, like barbiturates and things at the age of 10. So when I stopped taking all these things, I was literally – they would give me a bunch of stuff and then take me off. And then Because I have Tourette's, and they were basically using me as a as a test bed. Literally, I've, I've seen my medical records. It's a, it's an out, it's a freaking outrage. My therapist actually cried when she saw my professional blooming – doctor was in tears when she saw the blooming medical records what was done to me so um so taking myself off all of the pills at 16 my decision the world was a very spiky place and that's when i discovered alcohol and by 19 i was totally dependent on alcohol so um i can go as long as i want without drink now i can have drink here in the fridge i can have drink here and i if i'm feeling like i need a drink i don't have one and if i'm feeling like i expect it i won't have one and I'm very, very aware, and I have to keep on top of it all of the time. But um, it's been a long, long time since I've slipped, really. Um, but I think it's like anything. If you can control it, um, then fine. If you can't, it's going out of control. 
walk away from it you know it's not impossible uh, you just have to want to do it and mm. yeah it's a matter of convincing yourself you don't it's silly little things it's like giving up smoking um I don't refer when I've when I've given up tobacco and things for years at a time and then just been dying for a cigarette like you know like three years later oh, so I just but at least I've had three years off it's like I won't refer to I won't say I'm giving up someone says do you want to say, I won't say I'm giving up I said I've given up I've given up yeah. and that's that's shut it down and that's that's it and it's not, that's funny you say that because you mentioned a cigarette I haven't thought of a cigarette in months and for whatever reason I was just like. Ah, I kind of do miss smoking cigarettes. I, I don't know what it is. It, it, that's no. one of those things. That never leaves. That no. never leaves. What I did with smoking <laughs> cigarettes was I kept a lot of cookies, you call them, biscuits, we call them cookies, and I had a packet of them out in the kitchen. And every time I wanted a cigarette, I would have to get up and walk out there and open the box, then open the packet, then take one out, one, one, one cookie, bring it back in here, and then sit down and then eat it. And you find that you're completely distracted from having a cigarette. And the next time you even think about it is probably two hours later. And then you do the same thing, rinse and repeat. And I mean, giving up tobacco is pretty easy. I think day three is a killer. Day five, if you don't chew your own arm off, then you're through it really. But it's, it's not yeah. as bad as a broken leg. It's not as bad as being kicked in the nuts. Nothing like oh, it. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not, it's just not that bad. It's just, it's just uh, a bit uh, like that for a few days. And then yeah, you're just tense. You're just tense and you're yeah. on edge. I mean, the worst yeah. case scenario, just, just lock yourself in a room. If you can call out yeah. of work for a day or two or quit on a Friday, just don't go out that weekend. Sit yeah, in, that, relax, okay. play your guitar. Yeah. I mean, if I have too much coffee, that is, that, that has the same effect as me giving up cigarettes, cold Turkey. I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. like that. So, I only do that. I only drink coffee for comedy purposes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I become a, a a psycho person when I have too much coffee too. But it was just caffeine in general. It just yeah, it turns me way way up too fast, too much. No. I don't need much of it. I don't need much of it. No, I think caffeine's filthy. I think uh, you know, yeah, it's it's it's, it's surprising it's legal. Um, the really well, strong it's surprising. It's surprising a lot of it's legal. And you you were talking about the pills. When I was a kid and I I started having a panic attacks like for real at like 14 years old, they did I did I'm sure it was not to the same level. But when I was going in, it was just like, try this one, try this one. And I remember just like I was like, I don't like any of this. I don't like any of yeah. this. And then it was just, no, 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 this one will be different. This one will be different. And then it was a few months. Eventually, when I was like 18, it got to the point where four years of it, I was just like, I'm never taking any of this shit ever again and yeah. that's when I, I think i went six years from the, from like around that week on yeah I, I didn't miss a single day of drinking alcohol yeah like not one day off for six years and then it was just i'd take an odd week off here or there but i mean it's just like that was it it was just like nope that's how i'm gonna deal with it so it's funny it's not funny but it's like i could i could actually relate to your path of getting there because of that because that, that stuff man whatever and, and like you said how how is some of this shit legal you ever see one of these disclaimer adverts on TV? Yeah. It's like this can help you sleep better. Side effects: you'll die. You yeah. may, you'll stab somebody in your sleep. Your dog, like, just all these horrible things. And you're like, wait, what? Like, is is the positive worth these potential negatives? And no, yeah. they don't care. They don't that care. was um, that. I I don't take medication anymore. I don't take it for my anxiety, depression, bipolar. I don't take it. I just, it doesn't work. The the side effects. The last time I tried, um. I was on something, I can't remember what it was, just to get through my niece's wedding. I, I knew I had a wedding coming up. I, I was desperate to make sure I went there. That was the most important thing in the world. But it was also anxiety was building up for like six months, eight months. So about a month before I went on these pills and they just set off my Tourette's to the point where I couldn't even talk. I've got videos I was making around that time and I couldn't even get through a sentence. I'm not even sure if I put any of them up because they were I, they were unwatchable. And so I went to the doctor and said, I'm not taking these. And it was a different doctor. And they said, I'm not surprised. These are dreadful. <laughs> Having been prescribed by another doctor at that practice. It's like, <laughs> great, great. All right, I'm not taking any of it. I don't know. It's sad, man. It's sad, yeah. but, but it, it makes it so people, pe people always look at people that become dependent on things like drugs and alcohol. And they're like, I wonder what's went so wrong in that person's life. That they're that they're like this. It could be something like you tried 
to go about it the right way. Yeah. You go to a doctor, and all of a sudden the doctor has you eight times more screwed up than when you first went in, and yeah. you're like, well, I don't trust them anymore. I tried it your way. I'm going to do it my way. And you do it whatever it works for you. And sometimes, yeah. you know, I get you in the bad habits. Yeah, it's uh, like uh, we're not all built to fit in the same world doing the same things and so one size yeah. does not fit all you know and um i've, I've done it I, you know i went and i had a proper job and was an accountant and all this and tried that and it, it led me i was i couldn't stand it that's one of the reasons i kept drinking because work was so dreadful and then i went self-employed and was successful and had this business and then my head exploded from doing that so like now i wash dishes part-time in a pub and i bloody love it you know that's what I do from years of accountancy and doing all this really stressful stuff, designing computer systems and training, but I'm doing all this. And now I wash dishes three lunch times a week and that pays for my little extras in life. And that's, that will do me for the moment for the next yeah. couple of years or so. I'm quite happy just plodding along doing that for the moment. Um, we were talking about stuff and coping mechanisms and stuff like that. There are, I think it's like three things I tell myself when I've, when I'm in the throes of depression, which may or may not, help people but it's just these three things i tell myself constantly when i'm in the throes of a bad depression um I'm sure I can only, one of them it can't physically hurt you it feels like absolute shit or doesn't feel like anything at all because you can't feel anything but it can't physically hurt you second one it's never permanent it's never permanent um and number three all those things that made your life happy and made them good are still there and as soon as this bout of depression's over you'll be able to enjoy them again and i tell myself these this like a mantra i have it's never permanent and all this sort of stuff and that really helps me when i'm in a down um so yeah that's much better than a drink so yeah yeah you have to do that and i, I find myself coaching myself in the same way sometimes with stuff and it's frustrating man you know especially when it feels like it's it's, it's difficult when you have a child and you have to always have on your best face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you try so hard not to slip with it. And, you know, sometimes you can feel down. And the last thing I want to do is to have any of my my, my my really bad kind of tendencies, like the anxiety or shit like that. I, I don't – she doesn't even know that I uh, that I have it at times. Yeah. Like, I just – I won't put myself in a position where I could potentially be affected by it in front of her because I just – she's at that age. When she gets older, it's whatever. We'll, we'll talk yeah. about it because she's going to see it firsthand. But – it, it, and then it's just at the end of it all, like when when everyone's finally asleep and it's just like you sit in the room to decompress, it's like everything hits at once. So I have to do that, like cool down, like you just mentioned. You know, oh, we yeah. all have our ways of doing it. And yeah, uh, yeah uh, smoke a little bit of something, pick up a guitar, and hopefully within 10 minutes I'm, I'm a much calmer than I film yeah. a YouTube video about something pointless. <laughs> That's it, exactly. I mean, I, I, I don't, again, I don't take medication, so I've chosen that that shaves the edge off for me. It just takes the spiky corners off and it makes things, it slows things down to a point where I can now focus and get things done. I don't smoke and I don't drink at work. I don't do anything, you know, I'm, I'm working when I'm, oh, yeah. it's when I'm, when I'm chilling out and stuff like that, I'll have a smoke and a drink and that. And it's just, for me, it slows my brain down to the point where I can, I can focus even before my breakdown. I used to get the comment from people, you, everything you do is 300 mile an hour. And that was, a, I've had so many people make comments like that over the years. And so I need to be, well, in fact, they did a, I had a, I had problems with my hands and all this sort of stuff. And they did a test at the hospital. They, they rig up this thumb and then they send an electric shock into your brain or something. And then it measures how long it takes to come back. And they're measuring it and they're looking a bit frustrated. And they're, the doctor and the junior doctor are looking at each other. And the consultant said, do you know about your nervous system? And I said, what, is it a bit fast? And he said, we've had to recalibrate the machine. We've never seen anything like it. It's like three times the speed of anything this consultant had ever seen. My nervous system was running out or something. It's like, that explains quite a lot. So uh, if I have a little half glass of red wine and a smoke, then so be it, you know, because yeah. I'm still doing like 300, 250, you know? So it's like... Uh, yeah. So yeah. I, I I'm the same way, and you have to you have to do what you have to do, and it's better if like if that if that if that glass of wine is the difference between you being able to just relax and not be jittery or yeah. not have your head going a million miles an yeah. hour. I mean, 
you're not really doing anything that bad. You know what I mean? It's all it's all about moderation, like you said. Yeah, if I didn't have it, if I hadn't have had either, you probably wouldn't notice a difference. I don't think really. There, it's not. Yeah, I don't I don't do loads of it to get smacked. It's just like sanding the edges off for me. It's just a little bit of just yeah, take the rough edges off a little bit and slow things down by about ten percent, just so I can sort of deal with stuff. So, uh, but that's you know, it's all good fun. But play. But the other thing is playing the guitar. And I've noticed this on videos so many times where I've been having a really bad Tourette's day and I've got to the point where I'm trying to introduce the video and, I'm, and I can barely talk. But as soon as I get the guitar like that and I start you know, one, two, three, four, it's like a switch goes. And even if I'm the twitchiest I've ever been, it just disappears. And nothing else has ever done that for my Tourette's. Nothing whatsoever. All the pills, all the psych, all the things, all the hypnosis, all this other stuff I like to go through. Um, but yeah, there's something about that that zoning out and connecting with something and just putting all of your focus into it um, and nothing else. Because I've tried when I've been really twitchy, imagining I've got a guitar. If I'm sitting here on the or somewhere I haven't got a guitar and like almost playing air guitar, and it doesn't quite work. But there's something in that I think it doesn't quite work. But it's it, it, it there's definitely something going on. It's definitely doing something. So that's something I want to work on a little bit more as well. We're so similar. Uh, I say that one of the, the, the toughest parts about you know being a, being a full-on alcoholic and then just not doing it anymore. First of all, it was the worst time in the whole world to do that during the pandemic because oh. I didn't get to learn how to be a human again. I didn't oh. get to go out and socialize. I didn't get to go out and be in public situations. So I learned how to be sober in a 650-square-foot house in Southern California. Oh. So in theory, I was like, oh, I have my little space. I have my little space. I yeah. can go on my walks with my kid. You know, yeah. no, no. So I never learned how to live again. But when it came to actually starting to play out live, the first few, and it still, it still happens randomly, I, I will like, I'll make it such a big event in my head. I'm like, I'm like, this is going to be so bad. Like, like, what if this, what I like, like, cause I used to just get hammered or I'd have a beer or two beforehand or just have a, a whiskey waiting for me when I was actually playing. I'd just make it through the gig, whatever, who cares? Yeah. What, what's funny now is I build it up in my head because I can't shut my brain off because my brain goes the same way as you. Once it's worried about something, it's just thousand miles an hour. Once I actually pick up the guitar and the gig starts, I'm like, what the, what, what the hell's wrong with me? I'm fine. Yeah. Never have an issue. Never have anything. It, it's all gone. It's crazy how that works, man. It's yeah, like the best I, medicine in the whole world. I, I, I need to get back into doing, I'm, I, I started doing stand-up comedy a couple of years ago, or just before yeah, the pandemic. Not. And that was because I've got such a mon monkey on my back about playing live again. I used to play live all over, all, you know, all the time. Uh, I was always doing gigs, either duos, trios, bands, whatever. Loads of local stuff mostly. But when I, when I had my breakdown, I, I obviously stopped doing that, you know, social anxiety and all of that and i've never got never done that again so me doing comedy was a way where i have no expectations of myself and nor does anybody else whereas if i play locally in my own town even though i haven't played live for about 20 years there are still enough people around that would go oh bloody old robbo's playing this is going to be fucking good because that's the reaction we used to get and then in my head i'm then thinking no i've got to be better than they expect i've got to be like freaking i just got to take the roof and of course you don't just play a three chord song and get through it without shitting yourself. Really, literally, just as long as you don't defecate on stage in your own trousers, it's a win, really. I mean, <laughs> it's basically, you know, first time out, that's not a bad, you know, doesn't matter. That would be a win for me. So so that's why I did comedy. I, I, I got the offer to do a stand up comedy thing. I'd, I'd done, a, I'd done a, a comedy gig like years ago, um, and it was good fun. So I got the offer to do one, and it, this was just before the pandemic. I think it was in the November before. It went incredible. It was so freaking good. Um, and then I did another one in the February, and then the world stopped for two years. And I lost all my self-confidence and all that, you know, from all that again, and it's trying to build that back up. But I'm feeling a bit more on it now, I think. So I'm tempted to maybe do another comedy gig and – They've got an open mic thing just started at that same pub, which really? is not the which is not the pub I work at. So, so loads of people from work, anyone from work, wants, so I can just go there and be as anonymous as I can. Yourself, yeah. You know, and that's it's a nice that's important. Guy. That's yeah. important because one thing that 
has been a constant with, with, with my wife when we when we met. She's always been a, a bartender. And in Southern California, every bar pretty much uh, in the area where we were, they, they, they had live music. So we would end up, some gigs would be at, at those. And there's, no, I hated those gigs. I yeah. hated playing the places that she worked. I hated it so much because it's just awkward. It's just yeah. everyone there is weird. Like I, I would much rather play at, at a dive bar where nobody knows who I am. Yeah. I can just go out there, have fun. There's no expectations, no anything like that. It's, you know, do you ever feel like with YouTube, when you're doing your guitar stuff kind of the same way, like people who have watched you, they're like, oh, I expect him to at least be of this level. And then part of you in your head is just like, well, I want to be even better than that. Or just yeah. I want to show that I'm improving. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I mean this in the nicest possible way. I couldn't give a yeah. fuck about YouTube, my YouTube channel. It's there for a laugh. I have fun with it and I hope it's a positive yeah. place. It gives people a laugh and a bit of information in terms of what, what I intend to do with it. I just got 500 subscribers. That was it a couple of days ago. That was one of the lads at work. It took me about 300 years. Um, yeah. And I and I don't I don't, don't care. do it for that. I do it because it's fun. Because I make videos that I think I would find useful and entertaining. And there's luckily yeah. about three or four other people that have found them useful and entertaining. But the whole the whole thing of making a thing out of it, it's that's not what I'm here for at all. Yeah. Um, I try and keep it a positive thing. But in answer to that. I'm always trying to be better guitar player than I was last time yeah. I picked a guitar up constantly. That is my driving thing. Um, if I ever woke up and thought, I know everything I need to know about the guitar, that would actually tell me that I've given up rather than telling me I've reached any level. So um, that doesn't mean I apply myself and do 14 hours a day and it's took me a long while to get to how I play. and Because there's been you know tens of years where no internet living in the middle of nowhere no other influences and you're just you're trying to i knew three or four chords so what can i you know um but i'm happy with how i play at the moment there's big gaps and there's things that I, i'm not great at there's a couple of things i'll never be i'll never be good at fast picking my hands have been smashed up so many times that in terms of tremolo picking i can't do it I, it's just it's wrong my hands won't work they're they're, they're very very damaged I've had to stop playing for years at a time and completely relearn guitar and change how I play guitar like three or four times over the last 20 odd years because I've had injuries and stuff like that. And so, um, but I'm just constantly trying to get better than I was for my own personal amusement. That's it. Cause it makes me happy. Um, and I'm not, yeah, that's it. Yeah. You, you kind of took that in a way that I didn't mean like you felt pressure no, no. And like you care about the YouTube because I, I'm the same way as far as like if I have a, like a stupid idea for a video, if I know that nobody's going to click it, that's not going to stop me from filming the stupid video. Oh, no, I'm because not, I'm just, I'm, just going to do it. I just I'm, meant more along the lines of like, you know, well, I, I just want to, I, I, you know, holding yourself is just like even fuck YouTube. Say it's just even like you said, you're playing at the pub. Yeah, I, 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 I want to go in and at least hold at least to the expectations that they have already and hopefully surpass them for my own, for my own mental health. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, when I've, I've played in front of people who appreciate music in the past, they've generally appreciated what I've done. Yeah. So as long as my guitar's in tune and I'm not so drunk that I can't play and I'm, you know, and things that, you know, which I have done a few where I have been pretty drunk and actually they've been pretty good and I've got away with it once or twice, but generally, you yeah. know, um, I'm trying to do a decent performance. If there's the odd brown note in there, generally I'll let it go. Because again, that's that's part of it. That's part of, and hopefully that might encourage other people who are doing this sort of stuff. You don't have to get everything note perfect. It doesn't have to be pristine. Look how much fun I'm having. You know, I've got a cheap old Boss ME80, some old cheap sub $500 guitar, whatever. And I'm having a whale of a bloody time. And hopefully something I might do might entertain or give you an inspiration or something like that, make you smile. And that's really, I'm happy with that. That's cool. Um, but I started my YouTube channel so I could record stuff late night jams just on the acoustic guitar. So when I woke up the next morning, I could watch it back and I wouldn't have forgotten it. That's why I started my channel really. <laughs> so that's it. And then I just started introducing. So my really, really early videos, there's no talk, there's no nothing. It's just me sitting here 
freezing cold with a bobber out on it, like, just like playing <laughs> guitar for I forgot something on a cold winter's night. So um I enjoy I do enjoy I do enjoy the, the small amount of people that I got to interact. I've got some fantastic people who have stuck with the channel for years and years and years and it's really nice. And I made some good good friends and and all that and also via your channel as well and the live stream on yours. It's it's cool. I like the community side of it. But um you know I think I think in the in the about description of my YouTube channel I think it says something like guitar based idiocy and other adventures warning may contain pineapples. I think that's pretty much my the, the description of my YouTube channel. And that will oh do. Oh my for god, me. that will do. I don't even. You say that, and you say it like it's such a bad thing. I could not tell you what the description of my. I don't even know if I ever filled that out. Nah. Oh god, I, I I don't I don't care. Like I, it's whatever, man. I, why don't you make reaction videos? Why don't you do this? Why don't you just do, keep doing this shit? I don't, cause I don't, I don't want to. No, that's you're, it. You're costing yourself money. You're, I don't care. If no. I was doing this for money, I'd be the biggest fucking idiot in the entire world, cause it doesn't pay worth the damn. Believe yeah, me. Yeah, cause you're not I doing enough Harley Bentons. No, well, not the Harley <laughs> Bentons. I'm not doing anything. Like I said, I'm not opening up Spotify and saying, this is. Guitarist reacts to the composition of who's who's a popular pop singer Adele. I, I, I'm 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 gone. I'm gone, uh, mate. You uh, know what I mean? But I, I can't do that shit. Or you know, just like all this stuff. I get that people really want to make a living out of it. I respect these definitely. people that do that shit. Good for you. I don't want anything to do with it. How not, many not in them, that capacity. How many of these big YouTube channels haven't done the burnout video? Oh, I, I'm burnt out now. You did a video. I mean, but it's like that. It seems to be such a thing. For, but for the ones that have, are really relying on it for their for their income. Yeah. Oh, God. It's like so many of them have done, the, you know, just it's I think it's relentless. And I don't I don't know if it's a particularly healthy way. Um, and, no. Unless unless I had other income streams, I wouldn't want to be relying on this platform for money, oh, even God, if I had the opportunity no. to do so. No, 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 no. And, and the main reason I would advise people against that is because you could make like, oh, I'll give you a perfect example, Rob. I could make the stupidest, lowest effort, 10 minute video with no value to it really outside of just information. Yeah. If it's about a certain guitar brand and I, I can make that and I can say this, this nothing, this takes me no time, yeah. no effort. It's gonna get tens of thousands of views on it. If I work my ass off, on something. I really make sure that I nail the part. I take like 40 takes per each little segment that I want to do. I make sure the audio is mixed in perfect. I get yeah. good visual cues. I film it good. Nobody gives a shit. No. So if, 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 and that's fine because I'm not looking at those videos as a way of being like, well, I should be compensated for that. But if you were somebody who did that, the way that this system works and the algorithm works and what people in general just kind of like, they like stuff like what I mentioned prior to that yeah. versus not everything that you put your heart and soul into that can be devastating, dude. That's devastating. I, like you work so hard on that and you're expecting money back and then nobody cares. <laughs> oh, dude, dude, I, I, I would have quit. In, I, I would have quit in the first two weeks yeah. of doing this. If, they, if, they, yeah. if I had that mentality of I'm doing this for money. Oh, yeah. it would have been bad. I think I'm, I'm pleased that I never ever. And it was always a conscious decision. I've never wanted to do music as my job. Yeah. I've done gigs and I've been paid for gigs and I've done recordings and I've done radio stuff and I've done comedy stuff, which I get paid for, but it's not my living. And yeah. I'm very, I've never wanted it to be because it remains so much to me as something I do to escape and as something to do to have fun. I didn't want to be doing that every day. I mean, I know people, I've got a mate who lives up the road. He's a very successful writer, musician, pop star, or, you know, well, pop star, but. Um, pop star. Not pop Harry star, but not not pop star, but it's like um, he's got this this cult status, this cult thing, and um, he's he's brilliant. He works all the time, but he's he's older than me. He's in his sixties, and he's banging out five albums a year. He doesn't stop bloody working. Uh, it's a guy a guy called Martin Newell. The band is Cleaners from Venus, who are sort of like big people of the low brow, the lo-fi lo-fi pop sort of stuff. But he's worked with um, Captain Sensible, he's written for, and uh, Robin Hitchcock and all this sort of stuff and various other people. But it's it's sort of, if if you think of how English, the kinks, that sort of style stuff, kinks and Robin yeah. Hitchcock, he's very much in that sort of, in that sort that of thing. Main. But he's cool, he's a good guy. He's, I've, I've done a, uh, I was his guitarist for a couple of comedy shows and a couple of shows and things he did a few years ago. He's a good old mate, but um, he works his ass off. 
but he won't do media. He refuses outright to do media because he says the whole rock and roll business is full of assholes, basically. And he does things his own way. And he's releasing albums and he's got such a, a dedicated following. He records all his albums in his in his flat, basically a little, basically a similar sort of thing to this. Um, very, very lo-fi, very home done. And he does a vinyl release of five or 700 or a thousand albums and they're all sold out they overnight. Yeah. Um, he's, he's got various million song plays on, but he's, he's done it. He's done it his way and fucking good luck to him. That's great. Yeah. So good, I love to hear friend. stories like that. Yeah. That's so, that, that's so inspiring, man. It really is. And it is you, whatever you do, you have to do it on your terms, period. Yeah. You have to find a way if you're, if you're especially if you're going to do music, because if you're going to just do a regular job and there's nothing wrong with doing a regular job for, for majority of my gigging life, I had a regular job while I was yeah. doing it. I was not making enough money to, yeah. just, to, just, to just do music as a whole. Like you do what you have to do to make sure you have a roof over your head. But when you're really passionate about something, it, it can be tough, man, trying to make a living out of it. So anybody who can do it and do it their way, yeah, that guy's that guy's the shit. And you, yeah. you might have seen. I, I actually wrote down the name. Um, cleaners from Venus. The cleaners from Venus. Cleaners from Venus. Yeah. yeah. Cleaners yeah. from Venus. Okay. But they had I, one of their. They've had one of their tunes covered by uh, the MGMT. So quite a big I've band. Heard it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but they've had. That. But he. Um. Yeah. He's a good old. He's a good old boy, Mike. And he basically, I see him cycling up and down the road every, every couple of days. He's always, you know, we just stand. Yeah. He's a good old mate of mine. So, but he's it's brilliant the way he's done it. He's just said that to the whole music business and he did it i've got another old mate steve foster pilkington and the first time i ever came across his name was reading the music press the national music press in the 80s and they were saying this guy will be the next elvis costello he'll be this he's political and he's like xtc and elvis and years later i met him and he'd been given a record contract based on one song it they liked released it as a single with quite a big record company i think it was a uh, arista or someone like that and they basically got him in the office and said, um, right, we want an album like this. And he said, no, I'm doing an album like this. And I said, no, we want no, this. And he, basically, he tore a record contract up in front of him and fucking walked out, walked out on it. And he's still, he's my sort of age. He's one of the loveliest people on the planet. And um, he still gigs. He still gigs doing his political punk stuff with, he's also a classical violin player of absolutely like killer proportions. So his girlfriend, his, his other half-wife, is an opera singer. So seeing them two at an open mic night is a real special treat, you know? Yeah. You're getting in-your-face punk, and then they're doing a Gilbert and Sullivan sort of aria, and then he's doing some folk. So, yeah, he's awesome. But he, he did that to the music industry as well, and he's he's a good old boy. So they have a lot of respect from me. You know, I've heard a similar story. One of my One of my favorite producers and songwriters is a guy named Butch Walker. He was in a band. Well, uh, one of he's like a third or fourth band because he's from Atlanta, Georgia. He's a country boy, and he moved out to Los Angeles. He started with hair metal and that, but he ended up in a band called The Marvelous Three. It was a it was a trio. They got a big deal. Okay, they go in, they do the first album, they do the second album. After the second album, the, the studio said the same thing to them. The label said the yeah. same thing to them. They're like, we want this, we want this. Yeah. So they said no. But here's the difference in this story. Okay. They were not because they, they said, you know, screw you, we're not doing this. They had signed off. They weren't legally allowed to play together. Oh. I forget the I, I forget the amount of years it was, but the, the the way that the only way they were getting out of that contract was if they were not allowed to ever play together for a certain <sighs> amount of time. So Butch had to leave the band, and all of them were just so angry at the industry, the drummer and the bass as well. They're all on board. They're like, fuck it. We don't care. Like, we're not going to let you own us. We would rather not play at all than yeah. do what we're told in this. And it, it, to me, that was one of, like, the ballsiest yet most tragic things that I've heard from this industry. Just imagine that, being told not only, oh, you know what, your, your, your deal is gone. Whatever. Who cares? It's a record deal. You're going to live. But being told you can't play with your two best friends, like two it's, of your best friends. Oh, it, it'd be, no, it'd be, no. Oh, that, that's brutal. No. Brutal, and the balls yeah. on them to, to actually stand by their convention. See, and that's the thing I don't like about modern day. Everyone talks a lot of shit, yeah. but when it comes down to the come down and the actions really can become a thing, how many people are going to stand up to it? And that's yeah. why I it's just 
it's it's amazing to me that Butch and those guys they did. And and Butch ended up becoming a huge producer. He's done Weezer, Taylor Swift, um, bands like Midtown, Katy Perry. Uh, he's just he's huge. He's like a guy that's like a must have producer for all these yeah. people in, in Los Angeles. Go freaking figure. A rocker. A real rocker with a hell of a voice. That's I'll just... send you some stuff. He's he's amazing. He's amazing. It did baffles me. Would well, I suppose the right the record company would rather have a completely soulless album with no life because it's for because formula it's formula. In <laughs> fact, it was a couple of weeks ago, one of the lads at work, one of the chefs, Rob, was had a local had a radio station on. I don't know what the radio station was. It's some generic commercial station that plays beige music. And it was yeah. as if three yeah. hours, I said to him halfway through the three and a half, three or four hour shift, is this the same song just playing over and over again? <laughs> because it all yeah. it sounds like one of those dreadful disco mix albums they did in the nineteen eighties where they just got about fifty songs and stuck them all three seconds of each song with and a disco beat. <laughs> it's just like, oh yeah. my god. It's like is this the same freaking song? It's like no, it's like that thirty different songs by thirty different artists and I couldn't have put a pin in where one ended and where one started. It was just Oh no, I don't want anything to do with that rubbish. <laughs> so. It's yeah, it feels like I, I I'm in the I'm in the nineties and I'm I'm walking through like a, a clothing store like one of the popular chain stores yeah. where they always had that same song and it didn't matter how long you were in the store. It was the same song. And it didn't matter what day you went in the store. It was the same song. I mean, technically it was a different song, but you yeah. know, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it didn't matter. All of it was so mundane and just like, it was made to be identical because yeah. it's made, to, it, it, it's literally designed. So it's so mindless when you walk in, you're just like, you feel like you're in an environment. And I feel like, that was part of their strategy when they're making records. Like, this is what a hit song should sound like. That's yeah. why somebody like Max Martin has been, forget Butch. Butch has done a little bit of work. Max Martin has done so many number ones for so many genres. That I, I could tell you stories that, that that guy, and he's like, anything you've heard in the last like 20, 25, 30 years, he's had his hand on the yeah. majority of all those big hits, and he's done most of them and sold them off to the singers. It's, it's, it's so formulaic. It's so prosthetic. It's so like they they, they know it's gonna sell, so they just do it. And it's nothing yeah. against him because if, if you were him, why wouldn't you do that? You could make oh. millions of dollars doing it. I mean, granted, I haven't heard he's the nicest guy in the world, but if given the opportunity, wouldn't you do that? I. Uh... If you don't care, your name's not attached to it. What do you care? No, I mean it's yeah. I mean there's <laughs> there's. I get a certain job satisfaction out of washing dishes, <laughs> knowing they're clean. You know what I mean? I'm not just gonna let any old shit through my hands, mate. No, it's a freaking, it's a matter of fucking principle. It's a matter of principle. not letting the side down. Seriously, though, it is. So you know, you gotta be proud of what you do. No, oh, I agree with you. Even I if all I'm doing is it. producing dumb shit, it's like you know, you've got to, uh, you've got to care about stuff. You some, gotta care about it. You level. gotta like it. Yeah, you gotta care about it. I've, I turned down going. I turned down being in a, a decent sized kind of like really pop indie thing in California. Yeah. And part of me always says, just like, I, you should have just done it. I mean, they, they toured the country. They did all yeah. that fun stuff. This was before I met my wife. And I just, I was like, should I have done it? And I just, I, I couldn't do it because I was like, first of all, I was just like, I don't know how I would survive doing this because again, we go back to the drinking. And I'm like, I don't want these people to hate me. And I don't want to have a yeah. meltdown in the middle of like Texas or New Mexico or some shit. And the other part of it was just like, I don't like any of this music. Like, yes, could well, I they... really go, could I really go on stage every single night? Yeah, you get to tour. That's awesome. Touring is cool. Traveling is cool. I used to just get in the car and drive to Canada, believe it or not. I, I was a psychopath yeah. when it came to that. I loved it. But if if I think the music isn't good, like I don't think it was bad, but I didn't think it was good either. Do you really want to do that every night? No, I that's like that's like Can traveling. Oh, we're going to put you on a jet plane and we're going to put you on a bus and tour you across count a country. And then we, you can do like 10 hours of accountancy and then we're going to fly you back. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, if I've got to play no, the least... same three chords night after night and this dreadful whining auto tune beige bland shit. I mean, how long is it going to be before I have another sodding nervous breakdown? Just, I think I no, would have had one. No. I think I would have had one. I, th I think that, just... that would have been the thing that triggered it for me for sure. It's, you know, if you can't do what you love, do what you love. And if you can't, wash dishes. That's really, I think that's my, my motto. It's like, Rob, that is love. the greatest piece of final advice 
I've ever heard in my entire life. Do what you love, but if you can't do what you love, just wash some dishes. I love it. It's good. It's I gotta good. get going. I got. I gotta get my, uh, my 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 ducks in a row. My kid is finally coming home. I miss her oh, so brilliant. much. No, no, I, 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 I'm not going to talk too much about it because I'm going to sound like the biggest softy in the whole world. Uh, good I for thought you, I Mike. was going to have, I thought I was going to have like the, the best week of like, oh, this is carefree. <laughs> I don't have any responsibilities. She was gone for not even like two full days. And I was just like, yeah, I want her back now. Yeah. Like, I, I, really, I, I really want her back now. Like, I, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. Like, I felt like completely empty. So yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that. But yeah, good for it, you, it's Mike. really, it's really, it's really coming up. But I, dude, I'm so happy I talked to you. I'm so, I, I, I like doing this. If you want, we do this once a month. Oh, yeah. And, I, 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 and what I like about this is there is no topic. I mean, no. there's like little things that we hit on, but it's not like a, oh, we didn't plan anything. I literally turned it on. All I made sure to do is just hit record so that we didn't yeah. lose it like we did last time. And we just, <laughs> we just had a conversation. And, and you so know, I had a bit. I had a couple of things written down. We won't go into it, but I actually had things written down from your conversation with Ian, which I thought was fantastic, by the way. The upload you well, did with, right that, was, was we brilliant. Could, and well, I, but I ended, the three up, of us. ended up writing a whole load of stuff. Doing, yeah. Yeah. Why don't we try that? Why don't we try me, you, and Ian at the same time as far as uh, with a podcast? And anybody who has a dirty mind, you, you're a sick fuck. <laughs> don't, don't even get that, all right? I haven't but had that what we'll do is, <laughs> I'm not yeah. that sort of... I don't drink don't. anymore. I don't, I don't drink anymore. Do anything. <laughs> That's a good reason to give up. <laughs> yeah, geez, who knows the situations that you find yourself in when you've had one too many drinks. But, That's it. I mean, for, for, for this thing, I'm, I'm going to turn off the recording. I'll talk to you for a second after this. But if you guys watch this and you made it through it, God bless you. Seriously, God bless you, because it's just it's just two friends just talking and just shooting the shit. Yeah. So, you know, nice we'll see one. you on the next one. But anyways, yeah, take it easy.